corporate performance report and I believe that Sarah is introducing this and it's found on page 15 of the agendas. Uh, thank you Chair. So this is the first um, report, corporate performance report of this reporting year um, to help um, our eyes um, Kenna has helpfully given you the um, Appendix 1 in A3 and in colour so hopefully everybody's got sight of one of those. Thank you Kenna. Um, there, as you'll see, there's a number of senior officers here um, who um, will be able to answer questions relating to their services. If there's any questions for an area where there's nobody representing them, then we'll happily take them away if we can't answer them here tonight and uh, let you know the answers to those after the meeting. Um, other than that, um, open to any questions, please. Thank you very much, and uh, I've got a couple of questions, and then I'll throw over to the rest of the meeting to uh, come in as well. Um, and the first one is just picking out some of the items that are in focus. Um, and on page 17, we've got street cleanliness. Um, I guess the key point to note here is that we do have a new target and a new methodology in terms of how we are uh, tracking street cleanliness. Um, so I wonder, could, could we just take the committee, first of all, through what that change in methodology is and what it means and why that new target is different? Hello, I'm, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background that you might already know, but it sometimes helps to just run through it from the beginning. The inspection, the way we inspect street cleanliness is that we do three tranches of inspections a year, usually in July, October and February. There are 300 transects that make up each of those inspections and they cover 10 different land types and we've got a schedule which means that we cover five different wards in each of those inspections. So over a rolling programme of two years we cover all wards across the borough with a fair amount of duplication. Um, the assessment is based on a visual inspection of a transect sprayed with a level A being no litter present, if we were talking about litter for this, um, and a level D, which is the lowest, being a heavily littered area with significant accumulations. The um, score that you get at the end of those inspections is the percentage of the number of sites that fall below an acceptable level, which is why in this particular indicator, smaller is better. This is the first year that we're using Keep Britain Tidy to do the inspections for us. Prior to this, we've always done the inspections. Well, the inspections have been carried out by a trained officer who works for the council, although not within the environment department. It's been an employee in housing. The key differences between the two methodologies, which has resulted in the change in the level of scores and the, and the differential that you see, is that the Keep Britain Tidy inspectors don't have local knowledge. So they have in the past included private land areas in the inspections. That was the case for the first inspection that took place, place this year. When we pointed their error out to them, they have prorated the data, so removed the private land scores um, and prorated it with council scores. Um, the second thing is that when we were doing inspections in house, we would have excluded graffiti that was include or litter that fell on private land areas within a transect. So if you were looking down a stretch of road and there was a whole lot of litter in somebody's front garden, our inspector wouldn't have counted that in the score and so most probably would have scored it slightly higher. The Keep Britain Tidy inspector would ignore the fact that it was on private land and would just score that transect as, they, as he or she saw it. Um, and the last key difference is um, about, well, it's around the things that are counted as litter. So our in-house inspector wouldn't have included bird droppings or leaf fall um, in their definition of, of litter, whereas the Keep Britain Tidy inspectors do. And so it's all those three things that combine together, which means that their scores are going to be slightly higher. Um, possibly it's because of you could summarise that by saying it's because they're slightly more pedantic um, and slightly more thorough 
thank you very much. I guess in terms of that methodology change, then, is it is it fair to say that we won't really get a sense now of whether or not our direction of travel for street cleanliness is improving or uh, getting worse until we kind of get around to the next... Um, set of results, well, until we get around to the, the sort of next year's set of results so that we start to see that year-on-year -year change? No, we we should be able to see um, the results from each tranche and they should either be improving or staying the same. So there is historically a, a trend where the second tranche of inspection scores are slightly worse than the first tranche. Um, I've never been able to pin down exactly why, but it's just a seasonal variation that has been consistent over a number of years. So I would not be particularly surprised if there was a slight increase in the score rate, but it should stay below target. Um, but we will be able to see from the first tranche of inspections to the second and then to the third this year whether we're improving. Thank you very much. You also mentioned that there were uh, a number of wards being assessed in each tranche and that that would rotate around the borough. I guess one of the things that we've seen in the past on these cleanliness reports is a relatively high degree of difference um, from ward to ward in some areas where there's a much better performance and other areas where litter and street cleanliness is much more of a, a problem. Um, I guess in terms of balancing from tranche to tranche and taking into account that spread across wards, do we first of all have the visibility of that ward by ward breakdown and secondly do we kind of control for that when we're making the comparisons? We do have a visibility of the ward by ward breakdown so that data is available. I haven't brought it this evening but it is deep within the data sets and can be pulled out relatively easily. Um, the schedule of which ward we're going to or which wards we're going to include in which in sort of inspection tranche has been set up over a period of time and it's a running program so we don't adjust it according to previous results. We keep going with the cycle. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one I want to come on to then is on page 19 and it's uh, around household waste recycled. Um, clearly um, I think it's a bit disappointing to be um, here again, and I think it's interesting to reflect on a couple of, you know, or some slightly anecdotal evidence maybe, but feedback from residents across my ward, where in a number of blocks of flats, a number of private residences, there have been concerns about particularly the recycling collection since the change of dates. Um, so, so I guess in terms of um, you know where we are on. Uh, uh, the recycling rates and in particular looking at some of those uh, the proportion of collections made on the correct day what are we doing to kind of get back on track with that and to make sure that we are collecting at a higher rate are you, are you referring to the route optimization and and the impact on recycling as a consequence of route optimization yeah absolutely okay um, the route optimisation has been successful as far as we're concerned in that, you know, collection is happening on a regular basis. We have had some issues that, that are going to be discussed at uh, Cleaner Greener Scrutiny um, next month. Um, and that highlights that actually some of the issues that we've had are not about route optimisation. There are other things that have been going on within the service. Um, what I can say to you is that the collection um, for each waste stream continues to happen for every residential property across the borough. We are trying to target getting recycling rates back up and, and, and increasing the recycling rates. And there is a team that's looking at how we can educate um, more in, in encouraging people to recycle. The particular areas that you focused on in your, in your question were around um, communal areas which um, generally and nationally always present a bigger challenge for authorities in trying to get what we call clean recycling. Um, what sometimes happens is you only need one household within that communal area that can contaminate recycling and if that becomes contaminated we wouldn't collect that recycler. And the reason we wouldn't collect that recycler is it would impact on the whole of the round. So if, if when uh, we go to tip at Bywaters, the 
the um, level of tipping is showing high levels of contamination, they will refuse that recycler. So we, we would end up losing more recycling than, than, than by just rejecting that particular load. So we are looking at an education program. The team are looking with comms at what that might look like, and they've got some ideas that they're going to be presenting. Um, and certainly that is the plan to try and get recycling levels up and, and above where they are currently sitting. Nationally, there is a bit of a, a, a trend because there's been some good work from people like RAP and DEFRA looking at... Um, packaging particularly, looking at reducing down. So for example, if you take the weight of glass, um, no longer is uh, a bottle the same sort of um, weight as it used to be, um, similarly with um, cans and things like that. So there, there's a lot of work that's been going on in trying to bring down wrapping and packaging. And as you know, you get refills for a lot of things. So... There is some issues um, generally in looking at how we get the recycling rate up across the piece and making sure that where there is recycling that we are collecting it and we are looking to do that. Thank you. I mean, th this clearly is, and again, it's kind of slightly anecdotal because it's my ward and I don't know if others have sort of similar experiences on <coughs> feedback from residents, but it's something that sort of certainly they see as having changed quite dramatically since the rounds reorganisation. Um, and I think we're getting reported quite a lot that recycling bins, especially in communal areas, are not being emptied. And the reason given for that is often um, uh, contamination. Now, I think some of, the, some of them are slightly confused about that because I think they're not seeing a great deal difference in what's going into those bins as previously um, so I don't know if it's us being a little bit more stringent on what goes in there or um, you know some other knock-on unforeseen consequence of the way that we've reorganized um, but certainly it would be useful to look at the way specifically where that's given as the reason for not collecting that we feed back in a bit more detail around that collection because I think we've, we've all got residents that kind of go through those bins and say well I've, I've looked through I don't know what the contamination is so if we can maybe be a bit more specific when we're feeding back to residents on exactly what it was that's in those bins I think that might help on the education piece as well. We're, we're looking at um, reviewing the waste strategy and actually being much clearer about w how we um, communicate with residents what, com what is contamination and making sure that we're communicating that each and every time so that we're looking at things like sticker strategies that we would um, you know, tick box the areas that we've identified are in those. What I would ask um, members is where you have particular instances, if you can send those through to me, we'll arrange for a supervisor to attend site and actually meet with residents um, as we've did, we did for uh, another member recently um, and actually go to site, look at what the issues are, go through those in detail and then we did some door knocking as well and started to talk to residents about what we can do to improve it. So if you've got particular sites please do let us know wh what those sites are. Thank you very much and I will open to the meeting now for anyone else that wants to ask any questions. Councillor Kerrin. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the KP, um, KPI um, criteria for pr primary schools, good or better, firstly, um, I'm delighted with the number of schools that are good or outstanding, but in terms of the Council's involvement in making that happen, I wonder if we could have sort of more information at some point because obviously with the sort of schools that are controlled like local authority schools obviously there is more direct council involvement but with um, schools that are either independent academies or part of a mat I just um, wonder sort of how the council has been involved in actually making sure that they are good or outstanding how much of it is down to sort of the work of the, either the school itself or the mat they're, they're part of and and kind of, I think this is aligned to that. In, in the, uh, the paragraph about the school improvement team, I just wonder if we could have sort of more information about uh, how many schools are taking up this comprehensive um, continuing professional development offer and what impact that's having towards the good and outstanding status. But let me just say again, well done to the schools. It's really pleasing as both a counsellor and a, a parent of children in Thorock schools that it's, it's on the right trajectory. So. Um, if it's okay with the committee, um, obviously Rory's not here today, but if I can pass that on to Rory and get one of his team to respond to you directly, then thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor D uh, Duffin? Um, just on graffiti and there, there was um, a case recently where a resident 
complained to the council through the reporter app on graffiti. The case was closed. Walked past it the next day. Graffiti still up. Had to report it again before anything was done. Is this standard process with graffiti, or was it just an oversight? Or no, it isn't. Um, one of the things that we've picked up, um, there was a particular case of, of graffiti, and I think we're talking about the same one, but it uh, might not be. Um, basically, the report came in, and although it was marked as closed, what, what had actually happened is that there was some confusion around the, the address of the property. So when they attended, they found some graffiti, they cleared it, and of course it was a different set of graffiti. There was some confusion around the address on, in that particular case. The other thing that we are picking up and, and we're talking to um, colleagues about is that sometimes um, they see a closed message on the app but they don't necessarily go in to see the detail behind it and that's a little bit confusing for residents and we want to do something to try and address that. Um, just on with the wards, what Councillor Gerrish was pointing to, would it be possible in future to get the wards that are monitored listed just because if there is a jump one month where it goes from average to amazing and the next month it goes from amazing back to average and we see suddenly the five wards aren't as balanced as it is because obviously more money is spent on tidiness in greys if you get an inspector walk down greys high street um, in the evening it's going to be a poor report if it's during the day it's going to be a good report because of the way people litter and that would give us more indication Absolutely, we can include the list of wards that are, have been inspected. Um, after they've been inspected, we try to keep the ones that we're going to inspect a, a tightly kept secret. I think it's important to pick up on the last point that you made, and that is that whenever you do these tranches, they are a snapshot in time, um, and the seasonal trends do play a part in that, especially if um, the um, inspector turns up just after someone's decided to have a picnic in the park and, you know, or there's been a football match or whatever. It can make a big difference. Uh, let's come to Councillor Maney, I think, and then back to you, Councillor Duffin. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, an observation um, in relation to adult social care and health. Can I just say what a, no one seems to want to talk about adult social care this summer? I can't think why. You know, crisis, what crisis? Well done to everybody there. I mean, that's really a turnaround there. I'd just like to put it on record that I think that people have worked really hard there to, to get the results. On, on the issue of recycling, I, I think, Julie, we had a, an exchange via email a, a while ago and you said it's no longer possible to get wall-by-wall -wall breakdowns of recycling rates. Um, I mean, that, I used to find that really helpful, but what it actually told us is that some parts of the borough have um, recycling rates much, much lower than other areas, you know, dare I say it, collectively the people of Tilbury aren't as conscientious about recycling perhaps as people in Little Thorup Black Shots or Allset. And if you're going to target, if you're going to have targeted campaigns to drive up recycling, it seems to me pointless to go into places like Allset and Little Thorup where really they're way above target already. We need to be focusing on those areas that for whatever reason can't be bothered. And can I just ask how you, rather than just having a blanket approach, how you're going to tailor that so that you're going into the areas where really the data shows there's a very poor level of recycling? It's, it's we've, with changing the round structure so that we're doing a sweep across the borough, we now know where our trucks are every day of the week. And so whilst we can't break it down ward by ward, I can tell you day by day which area has got a higher or lower recycling rate than any other area. And I can tell you day by day um, whether that recycling rate is made up with um, garden waste and composting or with dry recyclates. So we have quite a detailed level of information. Based on the analysis that we did for the data in, in May, just after we'd implemented the new rounds, um, at that point, um, Monday was our highest level of recycling. And the area that's covered by our collections on a Monday is Corringham and Stand Fiddler Hope, so the far east of the borough. The worst day for recycling was a Tuesday, which is where we go into South Ockenden. Um, so we do have that information and we are looking at it, although it isn't as granular as a ward level. But it will give you a picture of where the, the worst areas are and the efforts will be concentrated there. 
absolutely that's our intention is to focus um, messages to particular areas um, and as I said if you break it down with dry recycling in the garden and kitchen and garden waste you can focus those messages even more closely so only pick up on, on the streams that are relevant for particular areas Councillor Duffin um, just back on bins, just from what I've seen on my end, in the office I work in, we used to, sort of before the change, we'd get one, maybe two people a month complain that their bin hasn't been collected. Since that change, we're seeing sometimes three, four a week. Um, Averley is a regular place, which Averley surprises me more than the Tilbury Greys, where you're going to get big communal areas. There's not actually that. There's not tower blocks. There's not. There is some small communal bin areas but there's not as many yet it's an area regularly bins are not collected or something goes wrong it's just it needs to be looked at because I don't know if it is just the change in the sweep but since the change in the sweep we've seen a spike so obviously something's gone wrong Thank you. Um, we are monitoring where we're getting the missed um, bin collection reports in and we're looking at how we can address that and we are managing that effectively. Um, I think it's fair to say that what's happening with the sweep at the moment is is if you do get delays it tends to roll and we've picked that up with Averley particularly um, and what tends to happen is it's Averley on a Friday um, so they tend to get affected more than people in the, earlier on in the week so we're doing something to rectify that and change that around slightly so that sh you should see some improvement in that area Thank you very much um, I'll come on to some more of the detailed KPIs then on page 23 um, and one of the ones that I'd pull out um, although it feels a little bit unfair to but since we've removed amber I think we can uh, go after anything with a red but um, the average day's sickness per FTE and I was going to just thank uh, Jackie and team first of all for um, briefing me on some more of the detail behind that uh, KPI and taking some time to explain some of the, uh, the drivers there um, is it fair to say Jackie do you think that actually we're about as good as we can get in terms of managing uh, sick leave at the moment or is there a lot more kind of ground we could make up uh, thank you um, no I don't think I'd go so far to say um, this is where we're at and this is where we stay um, um, as we were describing last week I mean we have a very very comprehensive action plan uh, working with managers continuously re reviewing our triggers and our practice in relation to sickness management but um, I don't think we're at a stage where we just accept this level. I think there's always more we can do. Um, whether it will actually impact, given the range of measures we already have in, in terms of you know, an exemplar authority with everything we do around sickness, um, we'll have to see. But no, I don't think I would say to the team, let's just, let's just accept it as it is, because we've never yet achieved that nine-day target. Um, as you said, we're, we're similar to last year. Um, our rolling 12 months <coughs> for uh, this current year is just slightly underneath uh, under last year. So the, the direction of travel at the moment um, is positive. Um, we can hope that that continues, but obviously we've got to go into the, uh, the winter months, which always have the biggest impact. Um, and <coughs> if, you're, if you are interested, I do have some of the detail of the data that you asked for for last week what um what councillor gerrish was actually asking is whether we have an indication of um different levels of numbers of people especially those who have no sickness and those who have high sickness so um thanks again to sarah um who always bows me out of my data problems is we've actually got um just over a thousand staff which is just under 50 percent who have no sickness whatsoever um, and then in terms of what we classify long-term sickness, which is over 20 days, um, we've got 168 members of staff. This is in the last financial year, so it's not current, which is just under 8%. Um, so, I mean, the distinction between zero and uh, the, um, the long-term sickness is obviously considerable, uh, but the long-term sickness is what stacks up the numbers of days so it increases our average so but it is a much smaller number of people 
Thank you, Jackie. And it's sort of an area that I'm very interested in in terms of that differential and the kind of the concentration. I think I'm, I think it's fair to say in terms of that long-term sickness that's affecting us. And, and I believe you also said that uh, hospital admissions was something that uh, you know came out of the blue to some extent to hit us in the last year. Thank you. I mean, hospital admissions and um, post-operative is, is something that has incre always been relatively high in our, in our reasons for absence, which I've always found quite fascinating. And we are doing some more work to see whether we can get under some of that distinction. Stress remains our highest reason for absence. But, uh, yeah, hospitalisation, operations and post-operative tends to appear frequently in our top three. Thank you. Um, so we see as well that um, the satisfaction targets for services provided by housing um, have been missed. Um, in terms of where we are on those targets, do we have a plan of action to get ourselves back um, on track? And I guess the other factor that's going into this is if we've got a high number of service charges rolling out for council tenants at the moment whether or not we think that that will have a positive or negative effect on satisfaction I was wondering whether to mention that myself councillor so you the elephants the elephant's been pointed to in the room I don't have to point to it um, I think in all fairness when the commentary was done here we weren't anticipating quite the impact some of the um, service charges had. We do have other plans to try and improve it. We've got social value projects going on in the sheltered housing um, complexes um, done by one of our transforming homes contractors at no cost to us and a similar project is just being shaped up for Mears Limited, the responsive repairs contractors to do um, some quick smart stuff in communal areas, repainting lobbies etc etc feeling is that some of those things, although relatively small scale, do impact the satisfaction figures. The other sort of encouraging thing um, outside the service charges issue was on the individual breakdown of the stats, we were seeing increases in satisfaction with completed repairs, and that would be a lagging indicator as we've driven up the um, response time to repairs and we've got less repairs outstanding. You would expect that to gradually influence the overall issue. The one that kind of um, tends to pull the, the average down is antisocial behaviour. Um, we're looking again at exactly how um, we collect that data but I think without making any excuses um, it's quite difficult at times to get really positive um, feedback on ASB cases when tenants often feel just dissatisfied with the outcome and there's a range of issues really behind that um, not 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 including our individual response as a service but certainly not limited to our response as a service and the last question I mean, there's two two clear areas, um, Councillor. We were still working through, as you can imagine, with the portfolio holders and um, and my colleagues in directors board, and the, and the wider leadership group. Um, at this stage of the year, and, and we know from the press releases and everything else, you know, we're, we're always at a very difficult point. Everyone takes the most pessimistic point, uh, you know, view in the first three months about what their pressures are going to be, and um, you know, a, a very pessimistic view about whether they're going to spend it all. You know, it's normally that, or a very optimistic view, I should say, that they're going to spend it all. Um, so there becomes quite a natural progression of, of built-in savings that happen as we go through, as some pressures aren't realised and other areas um, underspend. Having said that, you know, we are actively working on those areas which will not affect frontline services. That's always been um, officers' priorities because we know it will be your, your priorities as councillors. That isn't to say they won't be touched, but looking very much towards those. Looking at the non-essential spend, um, I know that we've already um, improved the Treasury position, for instance. Uh, another key area is that the um, annual elections, because that forms part of the core budget with three out of every four, that budget actually exists this year, even though there is an election, so there is a built-in saving there. Well, that's in six figures straight away, so that's over 10% of the, of the idea as well. So we're well on the way. It's actually made me think about it on the way down here. It's, it's about the definition of forecast. 
because actually if you were to say to me what is going to be our position at year end I would say it's going to be break even but what we've done is actually showed the pressures that will continue if we take no mitigating action and that's never been the case you know for at least seven years here now you know from that from that point so my forecast personally if I was saying it rethinking it is going to be a break-even position for some of those reasons that we've just talked about and I say I can already see a few hundred thousand of that you know um, already coming through um, but at the moment as I say that's just the gross pressures if we don't do anything and that's not going to be the case Thank you very much, Sean. One thing just to pick up on, sorry, as, as a follow-on to that, um, I know that we are voting on changes to the electoral system um, later this month. In terms of the financial implications that we've assessed on that then across the four-year cycle, is that on the basis, is that recognising that one year out of every four, actually, we don't spend that money and it goes back into the, um, or, or it can help us mitigate some of the other funding challenges? It, it does recognise that um, in terms of any financial um, impacts of um, yearly, three yearly, sorry, three elections out of every four versus four yearly elections, um, we've based that on three years' worth of costs versus one year's worth of all out costs. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on this one? No? Thank you. Uh, in that case, um, are we happy to uh, note the report? Noted, thank you very much.